Hey there, I'm Tiffany Youngren and welcome to Next Step Nation, a show that features podcasters and pros like you who share their successes and challenges to inspire, inform, and entertain you as you expand your influence. Thank you so much for listening. Today, I'm so excited to welcome Sarah Groen, owner at Bell & Bly Travel Luxury Travel Insider Podcast. Oh, and she's the the host of Luxury Travel Insider Podcast. Uh, she's an entrepreneur and an investor. She's interested in travel technology and niche businesses. She owns and runs Bell & Bly Travel, a luxury travel advising firm. And she, uh, Sarah also creates and hosts the first authoritative podcast in the space, Luxury Travel Insider. Having been to 100 countries and all seven continents, Sarah's passion is to inspire others to travel widely to build lasting memories and to add some joy and tolerance to our world. Oh my gosh, just saying that about traveling and going to all these countries and these continents. Sarah, welcome. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Good, good. So something that you said ahead of time that not a lot of people know about you is that you love and you work in luxury travel, but you feel truly at home at a shabby chic taco stand with some Tejano mech music playing in the background, having been from Corpus Christi, South Texas. I love it. Well, I'm not from Corpus Christi, South Texas, and I am with you, girl. So where do you like to go? Tell me more about that. I actually thought about that because it's sort of happened recently. So I'm from South Texas originally, and um, you know we loved going to like the taco stand across the street from school for breakfast. And it's just sort of um, a majority Hispanic or Mexican American community that I grew up in, even though I'm not Mexican American. Um, although sometimes I, I, I wish I could be a little <laughs> bit more. Um, and uh, we were traveling on a 10 week road trip this summer during COVID, like staying in the US and driving and like kind of distancing, but still trying to experience some things. And in Tucson, we went on a bike tour that was a bike taco tour. So we were all outdoors and socially distanced from our guide. And we would go to these outdoor taco stands and be able to try the different tacos um, that Tucson is famous for. And I was actually just thinking, I was like, man, like, this is the life. This is what I really love. I do uh... love my <laughs> Four Seasons and my Ritz Carlton's and my ultra high end boutique hotels and lodges. But um, that's a really fun just experience for me where I feel at home. Oh my gosh. I feel like we're soul sisters. I am so with you. I love, I'm with you totally. Like I love those fancy, beautiful places, fancy restaurants. I mean, huge foodie at heart. So any kind of new and interesting food, but I am so with you, you know, the, the shabbiest, uh, taco stand. I mean, one of my favorite trips, we went to Tijuana and, um, and another one we went and well, we walked across the border to Tijuana during the time that, you know, everyone was having a, you know, people were jumping across the river and everyone was freaking out about it. But it always, you know, going into town there, there are, you know, just strings of those taco places. And to me, it's like, if it's a fancy taco place, the tacos are probably not that good. <laughs> and they're and overpriced. <laughs> and overpriced. Exactly. So, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm totally hungry for a taco. In fact, I feel like I've been talking a lot about tacos the last few days. So <laughs> that's super awesome. The other thing that struck me that you mentioned ahead of time is that you love sales. And I have to say a lot of times marketers, you know, my coach, I have a business coach. I feel like everyone, a mentor is like so important in business and entrepreneurial life, but he was telling me one of the reasons, in fact, I interviewed him. So you'll hear him on one of our episodes, uh, Dom, uh, Dominic Cummins. And he was talking about one of the pushbacks he has with podcasting is that it's kind of a cover for not having to make our sales calls. <laughs> like marketers sometimes really fall down on that. So when you said, oh gosh, I love sales. I, I just was like, you are a unicorn. Like, tell me what, where did that come from? And how, you know, you definitely are a unicorn. I mean, looking at all your interests, but tell me about that. Like how has sales played in and tell me more about that. Yeah, I well, I'll have to preface it by saying I haven't been the like the consummate like true salesperson that's fully commission based and just goes out and like kills it every day by doing deals. My sales have been well in Bell and by travel. Obviously, I get on the phone with a client to sell them to come into being a client uh, of our company. Um, so that's a sale. And then I've my sales in the past has been sort of 
um, almost business development. So I worked at Uber Eats. I launched and oh. ran the um, Houston and Phoenix markets. We were the, Houston was the third market in the world to launch. So we didn't really have a brand name. Like I had to actually go talk to the top chefs in Houston um, like find them, find their contact info, talk to them, convince them to come on the platform. Um, so that wasn't a, a monetary sale where I was selling them a product, they were giving me money, but we did earn um, a percentage of their bookings when they sold through Uber Eats. So it was a sale as well. Um, I don't know what it is I love about it. I just think like each stage where you're like, you find their contact info, then that's so exciting. And then the next stage you like get a meeting and that's exciting. <laughs> and then when you are convincing enough to get them to come in and join your platform or or become a client, then that's really exciting. But um, I, I've worked also at a company where I led marketing and I wasn't in charge of sales that didn't have the best product market fit. And I, I felt like deeply how painful that was. Mm -hmm. So like um, trying to make a sale when you don't have a pro the product market fit is not fun. Making a sale when you have a great product market fit is like butter because people want your product. <laughs> so when I get on the phone with somebody who's who's um, either reached out to me or vice versa, and they're interested in hearing what services we have to offer for travel, um, 90, 90 to 95% of the time that that person, uh, if, if we think they're a good fit as well, they sign up and join our family as a client of Bell and Bly Travel. So it's a really easy sale. So <laughs> maybe I that's another this. reason I like it is because the product is almost the service that we offer sells itself to when we're talking to our target client. Yeah. You know, I love this because well, number one, that's all sales, like whether or not it's, you know, clocking in and, you know, commission only whatever it's all sales and every business owner is a salesperson or they go out of business. Like those are the two options. And I love what you're saying because it's so true. It's like what we have to offer is meant to make that person's life better. And so why wouldn't we want to go out and share it and close the deal? <laughs> because you're, you know, you're kind of doing them a favor, you know, by connecting them with it. So I just love, I love your out and it's really attitude because, you know, you're looking at it, like that's the positive end that you're looking for. Whereas a lot of times business owners, I feel they're like, no, I just want to put my nose in the computer and just do my work. <laughs> you yeah. know, no, so I'm, I'm, the opposite. I'm like, I want to chat with you about where you might want to go and we'll brainstorm. Oh, and da, da, da. So it's also my sales call is a very fun call for both me and the client. So I love that it. That makes it easier too. Well, and let's talk about the elephant in the room. You are in travel during COVID and we just like had our second big wave. And so you, you know, if you're listening, so COVID, of course, we all got shut down in March and we're talking in November right now. So this has been going on a long time, a lot of shutdowns and teasing reopens. And, and before we get started, Infinity, Sarah, I, I totally believe you, you, everything that you're doing is practicing social distancing. So I just want you to speak freely and we'll all, we'll all assume together. So listeners all together, we're assuming that everything Sarah says, we're assuming it, it involves social distancing and all the responsible things. Um, but I, I always feel bad when we feel like we have to like, okay, I went, but just know like yeah. we're okay. <laughs> like we didn't kill anybody while we were there. We were, so I just want you to just feel comfortable and just know that I 1000% feel you that you are a responsible citizen. Um, but with that said, tell me about your business and how like COVID's hit it. And um, yeah, let's start with that, right? I have like three other questions, but let's just start with that. Tell me yeah. about how that happened, how that went. So yes, travel is probably not the ideal industry to be in during this crisis. Um, but you know, I also didn't get into travel because I was like, that's the, the industry that has like the best ROI for my capital. Um, I did that before, right? I was a finance major. I did banking and private equity. I worked in tech. I worked in tech investing. And then I left that to, to try to see if I could turn my passion into my business as, as trite as that sounds these days. And I did, and I succeeded and things were going really well. So um, January and February of this year, we were up 180% year over year. Oh and then gosh. March happened and we were, we immediately lost like 90% of our revenue. So it was like, it was crazy mm. whiplash. Cause it wasn't just like we were plugging along and then we fell, we were like going straight up and then straight down. Mm. And <laughs> we were very busy at that time because we, our clients are, um, I mean, 
our clients are our clients. Like we're, we're like, you're in the family. Like mm-hmm. we are going to do everything we can to make sure you don't lose money. And this is the value of why you use a travel advisor because Expedia isn't answering the phone, but my team is negotiating on your behalf, like trying to make sure that you don't lose money, that we can reschedule your trip for no penalties, that kind of stuff. So we had to do that for every trip. So the first couple of months were a little sad because we were like negative revenue, like losing money, spending our time. I'm paying the team to spend their time to help these clients save money or not lose money and and no new bookings coming in. So it was pretty, it was pretty rough the first couple of months. And then we had a slow period. And now we've, um, we've started to come back up with people traveling for domestic and for uh, now people starting to book travel for next year. Um, so it was tough, but it also was really, I think, I think I'm going to look back on it as a really as a really great reset for the business because it allowed me to stop and say before when I started the business until now, I was so busy all the time. I was constantly like, okay, how do I get the next person in to, to help to be on the team so that we can keep up that I didn't get to step back and say, okay, are we focusing on the clients that we really want to be focusing on? Are we, do we have an amazing process internally that helps us to be efficient? Do we um, have an amazing customer journey so that we can garner higher fees and get the higher, like the higher tier clients that we really want? So we've stepped back and reworked a lot of that stuff in some of our free time. And I got to start the podcast too. (laughs) That's awesome. That is so great. Well, and before I want to, I'm excited to talk about your podcast and your you know, your turn into doing that. But before we do, can you just share a little bit about what your services are and tell me too, if they've changed since COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. So services are, um, Bell by Travel is a luxury travel advisor. Um, so I like to say that we are like an addition to your, to your personal or professional management team. So like your attorney or your wealth advisor or any other professional service person that you employ or your personal trainer or whatever, we're just a lot more fun. So we help you manage your portfolio of life experiences. So a new client may come in and say like, Hey, I actually, um, you know, I really want to get to do a road trip. Um, because of the times of COVID or whatever, up to Montana, or I want to see Yellowstone, um, or I want to go to the Olympics in Tokyo, or I just need a quick weekend getaway to the Caribbean or to Mexico, or I want to do the, my bucket list trip to Antarctica, whatever it is. Um, of course, we will help that client plan that trip, but I view our job as getting to know the clients really well and then helping them over the long run. So we're planning that trip, but we're also talking to them about, okay, what are you thinking for the next three to five years? What are your big milestones coming up so that we can be there for you to say like, hey, we know you really wanted to take this trip to the Galapagos. Um, Your kids are now old enough. Um, I think you mentioned you wanted to go around the holidays and that's a trip that needs to be booked 18 months in advance. So if you want to do it in 2022, let's start talking about it now. Mm. So we're trying to help our clients take a longer term view. And then in terms of the specifics, then once a client is interested and excited about a destination, we do the planning from A to Z. Oh, wow. All the details. We, um, not just planning, but we also use our relationships to get like ungoogleable experiences that you couldn't find online. And then also add perks and value adds that our, our partners give us that you can't get by booking direct or book by booking online. Oh, wow. And then I think the second part of your question was like, how have things changed since COVID? Well, I mean, we've gotten very smart on domestic travel. So I think you mentioned in the intro, I'd been to a hundred countries and all seven continents, but I haven't been to all 50 states yet. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we, um, and 95% of my business before was um, international and now probably like 80, 80% is domestic right now. Mm. And 80 to 90% is domestic right now. So in that road trip, I actually, we did two this summer. We, I visited 20 hotels. Um, so I like to, if wherever I can, at least the top hotels where people are going to be spending a lot of money, like I want to be able to personally recommend (laughs) that. So we studied up a lot on domestic travel. So I think we're pretty like we're expert level on that. Now we know what's going on in most of the regions that people want to travel to domestically. We also got really smart on private jets, um, and even smarter on yacht bookings and, um, and kind of like luxury yachting because those are socially distanced yeah. activities that you can do. And uh, we did, we did that, that those type of bookings before, but we just doubled down on our research and our um, relationships with our partners. Oh my gosh. Okay. My husband's totally going to listen to this recording the second we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I love what you do. I'm just so excited. And um, I, I just love it. And I think 
I mean, I could see how busy pe- I-, I love looking at my travel stuff. Like, I feel like that's part of the fun for me, but I can also see how, um, I generally know what I want and it, it would be amazing to have someone like you to just kind of take it and make it amazing. And I've had friends who have done that too, where they've kind of passed it off to somebody like you, who's really an expert at it. And, uh, and I love that your, your background is finance too. So, <laughs> I, you know, I feel like you kind of have the best of all the worlds. If, if, you know, people are going to hand over their, their travel life and, you know, like be their their person, their go-to when it comes to that. I think that that's really handy. Does, does your finance background help you in what you do now? Uh, I think it does help. Um, I mean, from a business, from an overall business perspective, of course, right. Because there are a lot of travel advisors who get into the business because they love travel, but they don't, they don't have a business background at all. The Mm -hmm. general, like the broader business background helps more because I, I also have an MBA and I, I know a little bit about every piece of running a business. Um, but the finance piece in particular allows me to think about things in a little bit of a different way, right? So there are a lot of travel advisors who are, are nervous for the sale and um, don't think about the numbers or understand the numbers. So they don't charge fees, mm-hmm. which in my mind is like sacrilege. Like you are offering a professional service, or at least I am. Yeah. <laughs> and um, to not charge for your time, it uh, seems really like hard to make ends meet. So I can, <laughs> unsustainable. I, yeah. <laughs> so I think the, it's nice. It, it, like I, yes, I'm a bit of a nerd. I do drill down to like project level profitability so that I can over time analyze to see like which clients are, are more profitable versus others. And profitability isn't just like the trips they take. It's how much time they take, like how much handholding they need and that kind of stuff. So I can drill down on it just to see like, are we serving the right clients or do, do we need to charge higher fees for particular clients, which we haven't done yet. We're very like standard and flat just to be fair and transparent. But at some point I'll have the data to be able to know that. So that's amazing. Well, that is exciting, especially as we lead into the podcasting conversation. When did you start your podcast and why did you start it? So I actually didn't start too long ago. I started, it launched in September and it was sort of my Q3 goal. So I started the beginning of Q3 getting prepared to to do it. So that's when I decided I'm going to do it and it's going to be launched by the end of the quarter. Um, But I had, of course, been rumbling around in my head for a while before that. So the inspiration behind it is that I I mentioned before, like I went to visit 20 different hotels this summer, um, but I'm always traveling, either traveling in person, getting to see amazing places or doing Zoom calls with my partners at different places around the world. And they always tell us these cool insider stories. So they might, it might be a hotel in Italy and they might say like, the countertop at the reception desk was mined from the Carrera marble mine that the oh. grant, the owner's grandfather used to work at mm. or like the tea cozies at this like super cute hotel in London were knitted by the chef's grandmother. Oh. Like all these small touches go into these hotels and then these tour operators and these destinations insider fun details that no one ever gets to hear. I'm like, why are, why do I get to hear all this? The traveler <laughs> needs to hear this. Yeah. So I didn't know how to, what I was going to do. I was like travel, maybe it should be a YouTube channel, but YouTube is so difficult to spin up in my mind. Right. I was just like, mm-hmm. wasn't so comfortable with it. Where am I going to get footage? And it just didn't seem like I could get the stories out as fast as I had them. Mm, gotcha. And then COVID hit and I had a little bit more time on my hand and I ha- hands and I have a few friends who are podcasters. So I started asking them like, Hey, maybe I should, maybe I should use this time to do, to do, get these stories out that I've been wanting to get out and figure out the best way to do it for me. And after a bunch of research, I just decided podcasting was best for me. Well, good for you. Good for you. And good job just jumping in and doing it too. I feel like a lot of times, especially when you know a lot about business, it's hard just to do it. You know, you'd think that those would be the first people to just like jump in and do it, but usually it's like analysis paralysis for a while. And then, you know, but it it seems like you took action fairly rapidly and, and got things moving. Did it, did it seem like that to you? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. But that's also my, that might be the difference between like finance business people and entrepreneur 
business people and I migrated to the other side of the fence <laughs> after I, my finance stint. And then I was like, uh, I don't really fit in here. I think. So I'm you're born. an entrepreneur um, all the way through, all the way through. Well, good for yeah. you. Good for you. So when you, um, so you interview your partners, meaning people who run the hotels, who run in different, um, do you interview people who do the excursion? I, I just happened to look up a couple and they both were these resorts and, um, they looked really amazing, but do you partner with them? Do you interview them? Do you have some strategic way of who you or not even strategic, but how do you decide who you interview and do you do more with it than just talk to them and then say farewell and work with them? Mm -hmm. So, um, what I want to do is I want to showcase the top luxury travel offerings in the world in a way that's really interesting to the listener and where there's insider stories because it is called Luxury Travel Insider. Um, and it just so happens also that my business does partner with all these top hotels. Like we book clients into them all the time. Um, well, not all the time, but you know, as not now, but <laughs> someday soon. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, so the, uh, basically any amazing, any luxury offering where I think the guest is good is on the table for coming on the show. It also has to be um, something that I would feel good about booking for my clients. Mm -hmm. um, like I, you know, you know, have visited and what's, it makes a top 10 hotel in the Caribbean. Um, but I don't really like booking it for my clients because it's not my favorite. I'm probably not going to have that hotel on the podcast, for mm -hmm. example. Um so it's kind of a combo of like what I think is really like amazing, like what I just think are the fantastic best properties and where I can get a really good guest. So my goal is to have the owner um, or like the CEO or managing director on the show, somebody who's really in, involved in either having set the vision for the company and can tell cool stories from when they started. So like the episode that that launched today is Hickory Lodge. It's a National Geographic Lodge of the World in Nicaragua. And the owner um, I just saw this island for sale on a bulletin board <laughs> at, in Nicaragua, like on a piece of paper and oh called gosh. them and like took a boat out to this island and came back a month later after her trip and bought the island and built this, ended up over a few years building the lodge there. So I like <sighs> to hear those fun background stories. So it's kind of like feeling out who are the right people throughout that. And then in terms of like, how do I partner with them? I mean, I kind of already do work with them on, on, you know, for my business, like, of course, I would definitely book a client into Hikaroa Lodge if they were going to Nicaragua and wanted, and it was right for that client. But there's no like, um, there's no like agreement for them to come on the podcast at this point. Right. Anyway. Right. Well, do you consider your podcast profitable? Um, probably not yet. Um, so I invested early on in the podcast, right? So I, I did a course, um, I bought, a, you know, a mic, um, uh, those are kind of like, you know, one-offs where, you know, and from a finance professional, you can be like, oh, pro forma that out. That's like a one-off <laughs> expense. Um, but I also, I also hired an editor and now I've hired an EA who's like half EA, half podcast manager. So I've got to overcome those expenses in order to make the podcast profitable. Um, but I don't think, I didn't expect for it to be profitable this early on. And I also don't think it's going to be profitable in the sense that a lot of podcasters are looking for profit directly from the podcast. Like it's already um, huge amounts of benefit for me because I have so much content to put out to my target market for my business. Mm -hmm. Um I have this amazing network now of, I knew these hotels before and I would work with the salespeople, but now I know the owner. I had a client go to a, um, one of the hotels that was featured for their 10th anniversary a couple weeks ago and the GM met them and gave them like an, I mean, they had like a, a free cocktail and like they listened to the podcast before they went. Um, you know, I have some clients going to Santorini next year, staying at the hotel at Marcos Tierramenos' hotel, uh, Cannabis Eo, which was, he, he was a guest on the show and his family basically like made Santorini what it is today. So I got to send that episode to this client to help them get excited about their trip. So I think it's gonna come in, in different ways over time. Um, and then as we grow, I, I think 
I think we might be able to get sponsorships for the podcast a little bit earlier uh, based on like smaller numbers, based on being sort of like micro influencers Mm -hmm. in the luxury travel industry. But for now, I'm just focusing on making a super quality product and then we'll see. Well, and the points that you made are so legitimate when it comes to profitability. And in fact, when, when we work with podcasters, it's, those are exactly the things that we're looking at is, you know, number one, inc- not, I mean, obviously our clients are really like, we're like you are, our clients are super close to us. We're really protective of like who they work with and who they hear on our podcast. But at the end of the day, you know, the lifetime value of your client is going up because they get that personal attention. They, you know, they're more likely to book bigger, better trips from you down the road and stick with you because they know that you're building these relationships. And again, the partnerships that you're building, you know, just being able to quantify that, I think you're going to find that, you know, you're going to be profitable a lot sooner probably than if you had focused on sponsorships. So I think it's really great what you're doing. So Mm -hmm. it is nice to have the business as a beneficiary of the podcast, regardless of the dollar amount, right? Like the business can support the cost of the podcast even right now in COVID. So Mm -hmm. if it doesn't do anything other than have us have better relationships with our clients, our partners, and be um, viewed as one of the top luxury travel experts out there, I think that's, even if it won't be quantifiable, I think that's enough to overcome the cost. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, in those relationships, you know, we talk about that all the time on the show is just the relationships are priceless. You know, you just can't put a number on it, but it, but podcasting is a vehicle that is unlike any other in the way that you get to build these relationships and the level too. And it sounds like you're really capturing that even this early on. Yeah. And I'm such a business like slash entrepreneurship nerd that I'm like, I'm like a fangirl when I get to talk to some of these, not because of the travel, but because of like what they've done. So one of our recent guests was Sonu Shivdasani, who was, uh, he, his current resorts are Saniva resorts in the Maldives and Thailand, but he also founded Six Senses, which is a massive brand now in Mm. luxury travel. And to hear him tell his stories, he's like a visionary in the travel industry. Um, Six Senses was one of the first wellness brands in travel and by far in a way blows away like what everybody else is doing now, like, oh, we um, don't, don't hang your towel up if you, or hang your towel up if you don't want it. Well, I mean, like, it's like on a different level than that for sustainability and wellness. And just to hear his stories, I was like, "Ah, I get to talk to this amazing entrepreneur. So, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, of all these people that you've talked to, I mean, that's incredible. First of all, I feel like every story that you have, I'm just like geeking out on in my head. So I should probably, <laughs> I, I'm a little bit like, okay, tell me more. So tell me about another, like, can you think of a guest that you had on on your show and you may have already, but can you think of another one? If that's the case that when you had them on and, and you got done with the show and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm so, this is, this is why I started was to share a story just like that with everyone. Yeah. I mean, almost all of them, because I, <laughs> I do ask them, I'm like, tell us something that we can't Google about the the property or something, some kind of insider detail. So there are so many fun, fun ones, but um Yeah, one of the first guests actually was a a guest experience manager. So he's actually the only one we've had on who wasn't one of like the owners or the managing director, but they were like, we think you're gonna really like him because he's been this sort of like butler type figure at Ashford Castle, which is probably sometimes thought of as like the best hotel in Ireland. And um, and he, for 30 years, over 30 years, and he tells these amazing stories. So he's told me that like, he had a guest who came back who he served every year for however long who was the actor who played Big Bird (laughs) and uh, how they became really good friends over time and then I had another guest who uh, in Egypt who did the whole all the touring for um, Katy Perry and he told that story another guest who uh, he uh, owns and founded Zanier Hotels which is a hotel brand around the world and um, when they opened their second hotel, Angelina Jolie came and stayed for f- multiple months in a row. And she introduced him to this plot of land in Namibia, which is where he opened their next hotels. Um, and so, oh, yeah, I, there's some really fun stories. Oh my gosh. That is, that is just amazing. Um, so one of the things, so how many interviews have you had? 
So I, I, I got busy when I started. Um, so I don't know if this is helpful for other people, but one of the things I wanted to do a good job on is having backlog. So when COVID um, starts to dissipate, we, I anticipate we're on the travel side, we're going to get crushed. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, I didn't want to do this as like, oh, I'm just doing it during COVID. I wanted it to have a long, long life. Um, this is a project I care about now and it's like a part of us. So, mm -hmm. um, I have stacked, yeah, I had stacked a ton of episodes. I think I've done something like 35 to 40 interviews now. Uh, we had enough to take us through April or early May of next year doing one a week. So starting in January, we're actually moving to two a week. Oh. Um, yeah, because now I have sort of a process. Um, I have a little mini team who's helping with it. Um, I don't mind doing two interviews a week. And as long as we can stay, my goal is to stay eight weeks ahead. And even moving to two a week, we're 12 weeks ahead right now. Good job. That's amazing. That is amazing. So how, um, I, you know what, I'm going to actually, let's see. Okay, so when you started doing this podcast, was there a moment where you kind of went from, you know, oh, I've been thinking about doing this and okay, now I've started it, but then you got into it that you were like, this is amazing. Like, this is what, this is going to last. Like, did you have that even pattern? Like, or did you always, did you jump into it knowing it was going to work or were there, was there a time where you're like, I'm not sure. And then you kind of came back and went, this is amazing. What was your path as far as that goes? I guess probably two sort of inflection points, like one, when I first decided I'm going to do it. So once I decide I'm going to do something, it's going to happen. Um, so I was kind of like, I'm going to wait, you know, do a little bit of research, talk to a few people. Um, I had a coach at the time who was just great, a great accountability partner. And he also had a podcast and um, I just learned enough about it to where I was like, okay, I think this is something I can do and it's something I can do sustainably. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to do it. So that was the first line in the sand. And that's when I said, okay, I'm going to launch at the beginning of Q3. I decided, and I decided I was going to launch, I was going to have one episode live at, a, at the minimum by the end of Q3. And once I decided that, then things just fell into place. I was like, okay, these are all the things I need to do. And then I was just like ticking them off as we went through. And then the next inflection point probably came still before we launched, um, but was when I started my outreach to potential guests and everyone said yes. Yeah. That's when I was like, okay, like from at least from the supply side, my supply yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> side, I I think I have something. Like people are excited about this. And mm -hmm. then um, and so that's when I knew. And then that was just affirmed after we launched. I of course, you know, did a big launch email and whatever else. I started to get um, hoteliers, like some great ones reaching out to us to ask to be on the show. So that's when I was like, okay, I think this, this is, is real. <laughs> real. Yeah. Oh, well, good for you. Good for you. Well, that's awesome. Okay. I am going to move into what I call quick fire. So okay. this is, yeah. So this is brand new first episode we've, we've done, I've done it on a different show, but I love this. These are questions I get asked all the time. So as a podcaster, it has to do with tools and things that you like, um, that you use in, are you in podcaster groups online at all? Uh, or yes, no? I'm in a okay. couple. Yeah. So you see like people ask this stuff yeah. all the time, even though as a podcaster who totally focuses on listeners and guess you're kind of like, why are you worried about that? <laughs> but, but I, and I, I'm always fascinated too, cause I'm kind of geeky on the tech side of things too. So are you ready? Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to do a very good job on these kinds of questions. So, cause I'm, like you said, I'm less tech and more focused on the, on the guest. Well, this should be easy. This the first one anyway, cause it's right in front of you. What mic do you use? Um, okay. Trick question. I actually use the blue Yeti Nano. Okay. And I am, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure that's the best mic for me, but I'm using it. I like it. It's super portable. So I travel all the time. So I have to be able to do my podcast from wherever. Um, but I also started during COVID. It was impossible to get certain mics. True. <laughs> I could get true. that one and I was like, it looks cute and I can travel with it. So that's what we're using <laughs> for now. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, I feel like talking about this stuff that I'm asking about now is so vulnerable. I almost feel like this is more vulnerable than anything else. Like I could ask you, you know, about your life, like why you did things and we could share about our families, but oh my gosh, once we start putting out there, what we use, I just, we get so, you know, you've got the audio 
geeks coming at us like why would you do that but the bottom line is and, and the whole point of sharing this information is like i view your podcast as being successful that's why i wanted you on here we're doing real stories with real podcasters and i love how you just like attacked it but you also have high standards i mean you do luxury travel come on now and so i i'm i actually launched it really happy that you're the one i'm doing this with because and i'm I'm happy that you're not like, oh, I jumped right to the fancy microphone. You know, um, I have a nice microphone, but my first microphone was a Yeti and it's broken and I'm going to put it in a display case. Cause I feel like that's the one that got me here, you know? And I just, I just so wholeheartedly feel like if people would just do it, like do the podcast that is that, that you have that vision for, and then put money behind the parts that are working sound always put money into that. Like that would be the next, that, like for us, like that was the first thing we invested in once we were like, you know, this podcasting thing, I think we're going to keep doing this and my Yeti's broken. So that was when we went, okay, we're going to invest, we're going to move up. But then from there, it's like, you know, if, if YouTube's working, put more money into the production value of the video, you know? So I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. So thank you for being, I have more, but thank you in, <laughs> in advance for being vulnerable and sharing this stuff. So so lighting, what do you do about your lighting? Now you travel a lot with yours. So do you do any like in your office or are they all remote? Um, I, lately they've been in my office and I don't worry too much about lighting actually because at the moment I'm using Squadcast so we can okay. see each other but we're not recording video. Okay. And that may change. Um, I have just for other things that I've done for different video things. Um, I have just a little tiny ring light that's about this big that can attach to my computer. I've had like the big ring light before, but I have one that's just a little clamp that can attach to my computer. It's just a little bit, a little fresh lighting thing that I'll use if we move to, to video recording as well. Awesome. Awesome. How about your, okay. So you just answered my next one. You use Squadcast for your interview recording software. And I have been in many episodes. I've mentioned this. It's like the second Squadcast comes out with video that is to what we'll be using. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I'm looking forward to that too. At the moment, I like it because it gives me just a little bit of extra security because my guests are international. And, mm -hmm. you know, I did one interview with a guy in the middle of nowhere in Africa at his safari camp, right? And he, you know, didn't Wi Fi cut out like three times during the interview, but uh, each recording was saved and each one was it worked out fine. I was able to edit the episode together. So love because it. everybody's in different places, it gives me a little bit more security. Love it. Love it. Yes. We're anxiously awaiting for the video. To, in fact, we have, we have like this whole process, uh, base, you know, that, that we do for the editing and for all of it. And I I've just been telling my clients and, and our CVPAs, I'm like, okay, everybody just be on standby. The second squad cast comes out, we're going to be updating all of our processes <laughs> to accommodate that. We're so, I'm so excited for that to happen, but, um, okay. How about audio? Um, do you, what software do you use to, what do you, to process the audio post recording? That's a very good question. We would have to ask my editor. Okay. <laughs> I know that that is, that that's like sort of sacrilege in the podcast community. People are like, oh, like you have to edit your first 100 episodes yourself. Like I'm an entrepreneur and I have a business to run. And I was like, this is what I'm not good at and what I don't like. So I'm outsourcing it. So <laughs> huge respect. I think you I are a, totally on the right track. <laughs> I did a practice, um, a practice couple, like for just so I could kind of know what was out there on uh, audacity. Oh yeah. Um, it originally when I did some like practice episodes with my husband and stuff when I was learning. Um, but after that, I was like, Nope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's really good. Um, you know, I don't think you should sit and do it yourself, but I think listening to the raw audio as much as we all hate it, um, when you edit it, it's like punishment for all the ahs and ums that we do. <laughs> like I always feel like, Oh, I've got to stop saying that, you know, or these different things that we know we say, but, um, but other than that, I, I have huge respect for the fact that you can delegate. Cause yeah, that's... we do listen to the raw audio and, and do some producing and saying like, Hey, remove from here to here, or this was this, he like rambled on a lot. So we need to cut this and that Squadcast allows us to mix the files and listen to them raw, uh, oh, before good. we send them over to the editor oh. too. So your editor, is it like a sound guy who edits it? Like is someone who's got some audio background or is it like a VA type person that 
has instructions on how to edit it or how, what type of the former, because I didn't know. So I wasn't able to like teach somebody how to do it. So actually I reached out to a few friends who have podcasts and asked who they were using. And I talked to several different people. I listened to some podcasts they had done and sent a, sent two people sample, uh, like, uh, episodes, so files from us to do like a sample. Um, and then, yeah, so this editor has his own show and he edits and produces for other people as well. Excellent. Excellent. And, um, so headphones, I see that you are, you do a good job of making sure you've got the headphones. So what headphones do you use? Um, I just use a, a actually an old set of Bose noise canceling headphones that my that were my husband's. Like he's onto his second pair. So <laughs> I I uh, I'm gonna go listen to your uh, podcast where you ask this question to other podcasters because I'm gonna ask for a new <laughs> pair for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So other than your own podcast, what is which f- podcast is your favorite? Oh, good question. I. I'm a Tim Ferriss girl. I oh, just yes. love that show. I really like long form. Um, mm-hmm. So I listen to that a lot. I listen to some James Altucher. Of course, I'm going to listen to a lot of entrepreneurship podcasts. I listen to EO F- Entrepreneurs on Fire. Yep. Um, sometimes I listen to Goop. I think they have some interesting episodes. I listen to some uh, Radio Lab episodes like on Sundays when I just want to like listen to some random interesting topic. Um, and lately I listened to a lot of, uh, pomp and what Bitcoin did. Cause I'm super into crypto as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that is so awesome. I love it. Well, um, Sarah, I'm just so I've been, this has just been so much fun talking to you before we go though. I've got a couple more questions. One is, is there anything that I didn't ask that maybe I should have? I don't think so. I think we, we covered most things. Okay. Okay. Well, awesome. Well, awesome. I think too, you've just given everybody a lot of great takeaways, especially when it comes to just coming out and doing it. I think it's really valuable to talk to you now in your journey because you've just gone through that whole startup. It's still fresh and you're seeing some of those results that are so exciting. So I appreciate you sharing all that. Yeah. And I, I guess I would just say, cause I think this is something I don't suffer, suffer from, but a lot of people do is that like perfection is the enemy of getting something out there. So one of my life mottos has been done is better than perfect. Yes. Um, and I, I've kind of been able to do that. Cause I've thought about that for years and years and years. So I've like practiced in my brain, like done is better than perfect, done is better than perfect, get it out. But um, another sort of little mantra I picked up when I was starting the podcast, I actually was just flipping through a book and I saw this quote, it was like full page. And I just left the book open in my office the entire time. I won't get the exact quote, right. But it said something like, you have to be willing to be bad at something to get good at it. And that's when I was like, okay, screw it. I can't get the right mic because of COVID that's fine. And I'm using my husband's old headphones. Like it's fine. I'm going to be bad at it first. And then I'm going to get good at it over time. Yeah. But I mean, I'm so excited to listen to more episodes of your show. I mean, at the end of the day, my son is a sound guy. So he masters recordings for musicians and stuff like that. So he actually was kind of by my side when we started podcasting in the first place. And he always told me right now, all you got to do is don't be annoying. You know, don't have those sounds that are going to drive people crazy while they're listening to it. From there, you're just going to improve. Like you'll, you'll start to see this is, this needs to be. So just exactly like what you said, be willing to be bad at it. However, your content's still great. You know what I mean? And I mean, I, you know, you still put out a great product. So at the end of the day, I think you're doing all those little things that matter so that you can still have a good product, even though you didn't start with a six figure setup, you know, (laughs) like, like, so I love it. I love it. Okay. One more question. It's really one of my favorites. What is your favorite restaurant and what do you order when you go there? Oh, this is almost as bad as asking what my favorite country is. (laughs) Like, yeah. Um, Like, (laughs) okay. I'm okay. I I have a better one. What, what right this second? Cause I know it won't be tomorrow or, but what, what can you think of off the top of your head that you're like, I love this place. I, I love Vietnamese food. So, Mm. um, I get it delivered. I don't usually go, you know, I did 
lunch and run Uber Eats. <laughs> I can be blamed for the lunch of Uber Eats in Houston. <laughs> but I, I like to say, to tell people who don't know about Houston that the, tri- the Houston food trifecta is um, barbecue, Tex-Mex, and Vietnamese. And everyone's mm-hmm. always shocked about that, but we have a huge Vietnamese population um, so much so that our ballots are even in, they're all in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese when, oh, wow. when we vote. Yeah. So we have amazing food. I mean, we have amazing food from all nations. It's Houston is the best melting pot for food. Yeah. Um, but I love to get like a hot bowl of pho delivered and like curl up on the couch and have mm. um, a really amazing Vietnamese soup. So, well, is there a place that you would recommend if someone was coming into town and only had one day and only could try one bowl of pho, where would you send them? Oh, Pho Saigon um, would probably be my pick for pho, but for everything else, I like a restaurant called Mai's for your like okay. vermicelli or your um, Bo Luc Lac, which is like amazing steak. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Sarah. I feel like we've all gotten to live vicariously through your you know, travel experience and hearing these stories about your clients and your Uh, and your partners. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your podcasting journey. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, Tiffany. You are so welcome. And um, thanks again to everyone who's listening. Thank you to our outstanding team. And remember the best really is yet to come. Happy podcasting.